Um, about 10 years ago, I uh, had an idea for a movie. Um, I'd seen a lot of horror movies, which I love very much, uh, with uh, blonde girls getting themselves killed in dark alleys. And I just germinated this idea about how much I'd like to see a blonde girl go into a dark alley, get attacked by a big monster, and then kill it. And um, that was sort of the genesis for the idea of the movie, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And um, I worked on that for a while, and eventually it got made. Um, Several years after, uh, the people who owned the rights came to me and said, are you interested in making a series out of it? And although it had been a fun idea for a movie, I wasn't really sure if there was a whole series there just about this girl going and killing vampires. Um, so I started to think about it, and I came up with the notion of playing all sorts of horror movies in high school and, and making them really metaphors for just how frightening and horrible high school is. My original script for the movie was kind of dark and scary, and it got, it was comedic, but the final product was much more just a broad comedy. With the show, I kind of wanted to get back to the roots of genuine horror, but with a lot of comedy and a lot of edge and a lot of sort of, you know, self-reflective um, sort of uh, examination of horror, but at the same time make it genuinely creepy and hopefully genuinely moving. Sunnydale is every town in America, basically, and really every town in the world. Uh, you know, we chose a bright, sunny, sunshiny California town because that sort of contrasts with what we expect, where we expect to see horror. Um, but um, basically, it's supposed to be any high school, your high school, my high school, anywhere where boys and girls are going through their adolescence and torturing each other because of it. Um, ostensibly, in the narrative, we put the town on a hell mouth. Um, which means that it's a sort of center of mystical energy and every sort of monster and creature and spell and bad thing that can happen from the underworld is sort of drawn there and that's our excuse for you know all these monsters that keep cropping up um, but really anybody who's ever been to high school knows that they're just there well we had certain rules about making vampires that we imposed on ourselves um, I wanted them to look monstrous um, so that when Buffy killed them, we didn't feel this was a girl just killing people. I felt uncomfortable with that. I wanted to say, these are demons. At the same time, you want them to look normal, so you can wonder, is that guy a vampire? You know, so we could hide the truth about Angel. Um, so we, you know, had the idea, and this has been done before, we're not the first to use it, that when they feed or when they get very emotional, their demon faces sort of come out. Um, you know, and as far as the characters of vampires are concerned, um, it's really dictated by whatever we need. You know, sometimes we have the froofy European Anne Rice type vampires, and sometimes you know we have the, the you know, uh, dusty Western near dark type vampires, and sometimes we just have a bunch of stuntmen. Um, Buffy has to fight every kind of demon that we can come up with: Frankenstein's robots. Um, demons, you know, with horns, um, uh, a, a ventriloquist dummy, and you know, any any horror movie that we loved, we want to throw in there. Um, this was a Buffy was an incredibly difficult part to cast because you really need a character actress in the body of a leading lady, and that's that's harder to find than you might expect. Sarah came in. Um, she was beautiful. She was accomplished. She actually had taken some taekwondo, which didn't hurt, but. Um, but the most important thing is she found the humor in it. She was very light and, and very engaging and very funny, but at the same time, she brought a lot of intelligence to it, which is something Buffy needs. If she's just a bimbo, eventually you lose interest. But Sarah could be as quirky and as and silly as Buffy needs to be, but at the same time bring real depth and intelligence to what she's going through. Buffy was always intended to be a role model. And, you know, we're not out to confront issues. We're not out to you know, to lecture people, but it was very important to me that Buffy be the kind of girl girls could look up to and relate to and show not only a hero, but how difficult it is to be a hero. Um, well, a Buffyism is basically just an odd way of speaking. Um, people often quote the sort of things that people say, but we don't have a lot of phrases that we like to use. Basically, it's not about creating a word that all the kids are going to go out and say. It's more about just sort of twisting the English language until it cries out in pain. Um, you know, we, I love language, and I love playing with the way people talk and their cadences, and, um, you know, the thing about trying to create hip, fresh teen speak is that by the time you get it on the air, it's over. You can't say what the teens are saying because they're not saying it anymore. Um, and, you know, the you know, 
40,000 sitcoms of guys going, well, that's whack. And, you know, for three years after, people had stopped saying it we were just embarrassing. So I knew when I wrote the movie, I tried to listen to teenagers to see what they talk like, and they all talked like Heathers. So that was useless to me, so I said, oh, I'll just create a way of speaking. And uh, if it catches on, then it will be what teens are saying. Well, Angel started out as a potential love interest, but quite frankly, we had no idea. Would he work? Would he be any good? You know, we, David was an unknown, and we didn't know if people would respond to the relationship. Of course, they did, and Buffy and Angel are a great romance. There's a, we got a lot of things coming up. Angel will, in fact, have his own series next year. Um, he won't be in Sunnydale anymore. He won't be that far away because I hope to do some cross crossing over between the characters. Um, Buffy and friends, they've been in high school for three years. They're about to graduate. And so uh, next season we're going to see them um, going to college or not going to college, depending on their characters. And uh, they're going to find out that the angst they've been going through in high school doesn't ever stop. Well, um, yes. Uh, I was a pathetic loser in high school, and um, uh, this school is, Sunnydale is, is based largely on my high school experience and the experiences of other writers who work on the show. Um, I attended a school, you know, in New York for several years, Riverdale, where I you know, underwent many humiliations and uh, much anxiety, and um, that finds its way in the series. I actually finished high school in England at an all-male boarding school. I play Buffy Summers, who is the chosen one, and to every generation is born one whose job is to fight the evil, not just vampires, any underground evil. Um, and a slayer is the person that is born to fight this. You are chosen. There can only be one slayer at a time. Every time a slayer dies, a new one is called. Usually you discover it when they come and find you. In Buffy's case, she was in her high school in Los Angeles, a sort of vapid and vacuous valley girl. and. Uh, one day her watcher showed up and said, you are the chosen one. And from then on, it's been her job. Sunnydale is a town in Southern California, um, sort of unspecified as to exactly where it is. Uh, we assume it's south of Los Angeles. And Sunnydale happens to be built on a hellmouth, which is a portal of evil. So uh, evil um, demons, they all seem to gravitate towards Sunnydale because of this hellmouth. Giles is Buffy's watcher. Buffy had a watcher before Giles, who we don't talk about much, who, if you've seen the movie, you know he was killed. But it's not something we address much. Um, Giles and Buffy have a sort of antagonistic relationship. He's very stuffy British, and she's still part valley girl. So a lot of it is conflict, but he loves her like a father loves a child. So it, there are um, emotions that are crossed there. Well, I think like every teenager, Buffy's torn. There's a point in your life when you're not a child anymore, but you're not an adult. And there are decisions to be made that people don't want to help you with, and it's a very, very difficult time. And there's Buffy just trying to deal with the problems of adolescence, of dating, of parenting, of, you know, learning when to cross the line, when not to. At the same time, she has this adult job and adult responsibility, and the two worlds collide. Well, as I've gotten older, so has Buffy, obviously, aside from the physical and the, the hairdos changing and the hair colors. Um, Buffy's matured through her experiences. She's seen a lot now. She's had her first love. She's had her first sexual experience. And she's gone through a lot of things with her friends. And like anybody, that changes you. Joss has his own sort of language. That's a little difficult for us mere mortals to understand. I grew up in New York. We didn't have Valley Girls. And a lot of times, I'm actually, I should say constantly, I'm asking him, what, what does this mean? I, I'm not quite sure. There's a very funny story around here and that revolves around the audition where the first line is, what's the sitch? And there I go walking in and my first, what does this mean? No idea meant situation. Talk about blowing a job instantly. Joss is brilliant. I mean, the show is his baby. These ideas are all in his head and it's wonderful to see him take them from up here and most of the time able to explain them to us. Um, the show is done with love and, and that's the amazing thing and it's not just Joss, it's everybody. It's every grip and electrician and everybody loves the show. It's a very brutal show to make. The hours are horrible. The conditions are never wonderful. We work a lot of nights, a lot of smoke, a lot of fire. The show couldn't be done if everybody didn't love doing it and was proud of the work that they did. Well, I think the beauty of the show is that it appeals to everybody. It's a show that adults can watch with their children. You know, young children just enjoy the monsters and the, the pretty people and the, the funny jokes. 
older teenagers can relate to it, especially females. It's the first time in a long time now the trend is moving towards it. We're gravitating towards these strong female individuals that people can look up to. Buffy is not the smartest in her school. She's not the prettiest. She's not the most popular. She's okay with who she is. And it's very important as a teenager that you have someone that you can look up to that's an individual. Because as we all know, high school is not your sheep. You, you follow the trends, and it's wonderful to learn that individuality is important. Young, you know, early 20s, it's just a fun, campy show, and adults can watch it with their children and later talk about the messages that we incorporate. Um, a lot of the metaphors that Joss uses relate to everybody. I mean, at some point in their life, everybody knows what it's like to feel invisible in school. The people don't notice you. Our girl just happens to actually turn invisible. Every day is a challenge on this show. Um, between sitting in makeup for all this time to get these bruises to going from a happy scene to a crying scene to it's 2 o'clock in the morning and we're still doing action work, it is a very difficult show to do. Yeah, so my relationship uh, with Buffy is the fact that, you know, um, his name is Angel. He's a 242-year-old vampire with a conscience who has feelings for Buffy, who is a vampire slayer. And in the beginning of the, the whole episodes, the beginning of the season, she didn't know he was a vampire and now found out. And uh, uh, so now that I am a vampire, she's, there's that tension, that romantic heat that's between the two of us. Should she kill? Should she not kill? And she can't kill because I have feelings for her and she knows I'm good, but... Uh, I probably will turn bad. Yeah, they were basically um, pretty much in the 11th hour with the character, and they had looked for, you know, all over the place for this guy. And um, um, I, at the time, I was, you know, I, was, I didn't have a manager, and I was walking my dog, and my manager saw me walking my dog. And he said, oh, this guy would be great for the part. You know, I know the casting director. So um, he stopped me and said, you know, I'd like to take you in and, for this part, are you an actor? Yeah, and I said, and I said, yeah. And uh, before I knew it, I was in reading for Buffy. Got the part, wasn't even signed with my manager, and um, it's just snowballed from there. It's just the character has literally taken off from uh, a seven out of twelve in the first episode to being a series regular the second season and becoming part of the team. So it's been quite a ride. He's uh, moving away from Sunnydale, and uh, Joss has, has created his own, his second series called Angel, which uh, will take place in Los Angeles, and uh, it'll be more of an adult-oriented show where I will fight the demons of, like again, um, uh, the demons of people's pasts, what they hold on to, and uh, you know what Angel lives for, and what he he goes through with his nightmares, he'll try to make amends with through other people by killing uh, their own demons and somewhat trying to regain his own soul in the process. So it should make for very interesting episodes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, he's really um, in tune with his actors and his writers and his people that he works with, and he's on the set, which makes it very comfortable. Um, not only a creator of a show, but somebody who comes down to the set while they're shooting and gives his own personal notes, which is, uh, doesn't really happen today in Hollywood on television shows. Um, Sarah's... Uh, she is one of the other things I will miss the most about um, leaving the show is working with Sarah. Um, we've created a, a special bond between the two of us that um, is very unique and different. And um, she has the the ability to transform herself very quickly, um, very professionally, and uh, very openly, which makes it easier for another actor to kind of ride along with her. Um, she comforts you and, and gives you a sense of who you are as a person and not as an actor, which is, um, I feel, the best thing to have. Um, um, she's just a, she's a wonderful presence and she's very strong in what she does. She's, she exudes a lot of confidence and, um, and it shows and, uh, and I'll miss that a lot. Yeah, the, the makeup process takes about an hour and 20 minutes. It's a piece that fits from here to here and Todd McIntosh is wonderful. Uh, you know, he, he just blends it all in, so the final result's very sharp and clean, makes for a very scary vampire. Um, it can be tedious, and taking it off is the worst part because you, you have to sit there and you want to just rip the damn thing off, but you can't because it, you'll take a piece of your skin with you, so it has to be um, removed um, very delicately to take it off. And, uh, but the end result is great. It's worth it. it definitely is worth it. It's a wide range, and that's the, one of the most surprising things about it, is the fact that they see Buffy the Vampire Slayer, think teenage, but you know what? Watch it, and you'll be surprised, because the writing 
dictates the show and leads you on a ride that you'll have a lot of fun with. Uh, well, I play Willow Rosenberg, and uh, she's the computer genius of the show, I would say. And uh, she's Buffy's best friend. And yeah, that's, that's Willow. One element? Oh, wow. Um, there's so many great elements of the show, but I, I really think that, that it's the writing. You know, we have such incredible scripts, and we're just so fortunate to, to be able to, you know, get to act that stuff. So, so I would say that the best part of the show is, is definitely the writing, you know, because then we have so much less that we need to do, you know? You just sort of show up and know the lines, and, and it all clicks. Joss. Joss is, is just an incredible genius, and, uh, and the way he just comes up with things, it's, it's incredible. I would love to just get around and explore inside his brain, but that's not possible, because I've tried, and he just won't let me. He's like, get away from me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, he's just incredible, and, uh, and he's just always on the ball, and always has millions of ideas floating. I think Willow's a good role model. She does extremely well in uh, school, which is very important. And, uh, you know, and, and she's, I think, the most realistic character, you know, when, when you look at, at the kids in high school and stuff. It's just the mail that I, I receive is, is always talking about, you know, oh, I'm just like Willow, or my, my best friend is just like Willow. So, uh, so I know people out there can definitely relate to her. And, uh, you know, I just think that, that, like, Buffy is the girl everybody wants to be, but Willow is more like what they are, you know, which is, is good. It's just she does enough superpowers. What, uh, what qualities does Buffy have? makes her a good role model. Well, you know, she's, uh, she's smart. Uh, she stands up for herself. And even if they play on the whole, you know, she doesn't do as well as she could in school. She does. She scored high on her SATs. So, um, Anna, and she's just, she's a great role model for girls because it, it shows that, that, you know, that you can be strong and confident and, you know, and, and be independent and not have to just go with the flow in high school. I play, I, I play Xander Lavelle Harris. Um, he's, uh, he's very deep. He's kind of like the spiritual advisor to everybody. No, oh, kidding. I'm just a funny guy, you know, joke here, joke there. I'm like seasoning. I'm... I'm kissing more girls now, which is good. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more physically active, um, sexually, of course, but it's all very safe. And, uh, and in terms of the physical stuff, I guess I've just become more, uh, more brave, you know, before I would kind of squeal. Have you ever um, stuck a pig before? No? They squeal, man. man it, it loud. Uh, first season, I was like, I would squeal like a stuck pig. Uh, now I'm, I'm pretty much, I, 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 I say, hey! Don't do that, and then I'll run. Yeah, we had a lot of people die in my high school. <laughs> it was tragic, too, and, and we had a mayor that would just try to hide it all. Uh, no, I, I, I wish it was like this. I didn't date in high school at all, and, um, and lines weren't written for me. I didn't go into a classroom knowing what was going to happen. You know what I mean? I wish I did. Now I go into a classroom knowing what's going to happen, like what my test is going to be. So, uh, but no, it's, 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 I hated high school. I, with a passion, I hated high school. So it's nice to, to be able to relive it again. Buffy. Oh, the Buffy, oh, the Buffyism? Uh, what's the sitch? Uh, what's the 411? Um, uh, hi. <laughs> no, I don't, that's not a Buffyism, that's just normalism. Um, I, this, they have this certain, pretty much they, they chop words in half. So that sentence would be, they, cha, or, ha. That would be a Buffyism. Um, yes, I'm, I'm basically, I'm Buffy's watcher. The, um, the basic premise is that we have a, an American high school girl 
who is told um, in her teens that she is the only woman, the only girl uh, in all the world in her of her generation who is, has ch been chosen to, um, to hunt and uh, kill vampires. Uh, and um, she's already had a bad experience with that. She's burnt a, a school gym down and she's moved uh, away from, from where she was in order to um, start life afresh and forget the fact that she's the chosen one, the slayer. And she pitches up at Sunnydale High School where I'm waiting for her. Um, I am her watcher, who is basically her mentor, the person who's been chosen to watch over her, to take care of her, to train her, to discipline her, to teach her. Um, and she's um, not terribly happy with that. She really just wants to go out with boys, paint her fingernails and go to the mall. It's, yeah, I mean, the, the, the reason he's British is, is because it provides a, um, uh, a nice um, foil for Buffy's very American um, attitudes, and she's very, you know, she's very teenage. So there's a total culture clash, total t culture clash. I mean, she's talking in a language that my character doesn't understand. Even though we speak the same language, we don't speak the same language. Well, normally... Brits out here get cast as either the bad guys or the, uh, or the complete fools. Giles is not a fool. He's, he's um, deeply learned. One of the choices I made um, at the beginning was that I've prepared for this for some time and that it's, there's a lot of theory gone into it, but that I've had absolutely no practical experience. Um, so that when we actually first get into the, uh, the, the fray, it's a, a, a bit of a shock and, and uh, um, there's a, a fair amount of ground to be had from that. It's the first time that anyone has proven that you can have real humour, wit, um, dry humour, uh, and then at the same time have um, tragedy, real tragedy and thrills and horror. Normally, um, if comedy and horror go together, it's a spoof. That's the only way people really have ever dealt with it before. And Joss set out from the beginning to, to, to say, you can have all the emotions, you can, you know, and, and they are heightened by the existence of the other emotions. She doesn't stop. I mean, I, thank, thankfully, she's young. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she, um, she doesn't stop. She's in it um, eight days out of eight days. Uh, very rarely is she not on set. Um, she does uh, a lot of, of the physical stuff. She does have a stunt double, but, um, you know, thank God, to be honest, because, I mean, she'd beaten, be beaten to a pulp by now. She's very nasty in the beginning, but um, as time goes on, she becomes more dimensional. There's um, some interaction going on with the other characters that creates... Um, there's always conflict between Cordelia and Buffy, which is always fun to watch. Um, but then there's a romance involved, and so we get to see a softer side of Cordelia, which is nicer and um, surprisingly heroic at times. And um, she's, you know, pretty darn interesting character, in my opinion. <laughs> Through romance, um, Xander and Cordelia have a lot of sexual tension pent up um, since, I guess, we've known each other since we were, long, uh, since we were kids in elementary school. And, um, you know, opposites attract. So she, he's very tight with Willow and Buffy, which is, you know, considered the Scooby gang, and that was kind of my way in. I think that, first of all, the show is very, um, it's nice to look at. It's shot well. The cinematography is amazing. It's darker, so you're attracted to it immediately because it's different from anything else you might see on television, especially that's ho a high school oriented. Um, I think the fact that there's a lot of teen angst, there's um, a lot of appeal with watching someone such as Buffy, um, a young, pretty girl struggling, you know, coping with situations as they're drawn. She feels different because she's a slayer. Um, that's very compelling. So there's like a drama element. There's a lot of humor and self-deprecation involved. Like, the show makes fun of itself in a lot of ways. Um, that's attractive. And special effects and the fighting, you know, draws the men. 
And uh, I don't know. It's just a great show. It's a very ambitious show. There's a, we try to tackle a lot of things in one show, and I think we're pretty successful at it. I don't think there's anything else really out on television that does all of those things, humor and drama and special effects and comedy. It's just, it's great. Uh, she has a lot of strength in that department. Um, well, she's been doing it for many, many years, so she's a veteran. She's a consummate professional in the regards of knowing where her mark's hitting her mark, um, knowing her light, knowing her lines. Um, and she's skilled in the regard that if she needs to cry, like, she can do that. She, she's just, uh, she's, she works a lot, and that's why. She's a talented, talented actress. That's the one thing that we've we've been really uh, conscious of is maintaining the the core of the character, which is uh, uh, an intelligent, inquisitive, um, and he keeps to himself. He doesn't say anything unless he's got something very specific to say. And we, whenever he talks, it's usually some grand observation involving everyone's perception of a certain situation instead of just his own. I like that a lot. People people make the metaphorical comparison all the time. Um, I didn't really. Uh, have a horrific high school career, so I can't equate that to battling demons and monsters on the hellmouth. But, you know, some people apparently didn't uh, get along with their teachers and other kids. I don't know. So the first time I met him at this audition, I was really excited by uh, how much he cared about even the most periphery characters. He wanted everything to be very specific. He had a, he had a real vision for everything that was going on. I liked that a lot. And that was what one of the deciding factors for me wanting to be a regular on the show when they asked me was I knew that um, the person who, whose vision this was was going to stay on. He wasn't going to, like, bake it and then leave it for other people to distribute. He's on the set all the time. He's very um, specific and, and nurturing to it so that we all feel like an important part. Well, at the end of the second season, it's quite a, uh, a shock for Joyce to discover that uh, my daughter is a vampire slayer. So uh, this year, I'm really having to contend with that. You know, what it's like to have a daughter who has superpowers and, you know, worrying about her getting hurt and taking on the world. And at the same time, that, that point between a parent and a teenager, how much of her life can I share? You know, how much do I need to stay out of the way? And that's one thing that's really special about the show, too, is a lot of times um, the main writer or producer will start to kind of back off and turn the reins over to somebody else and move on to another project, and Joss is incredibly hands-on. I mean, he comes down and watches almost every rehearsal and uh, is just really there to keep the thread and the through line and the continuity of the whole thing going.